From the fight for a $15 minimum wage to the nationwide teacher strikes, from Bernie to AOC, from Black Lives Matter to Me Too, Generation Occupy, the book by our next guest, Michael Levitin, reveals the lasting impacts of the Occupy movement on the American politics and culture. Michael Levitin joining us right now, journalist, former occupier, co-founding editor of the Occupied Wall Street Journal. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be with you, Juliana. It's such a great uh, compilation and sort of remembering of Occupy watching watching the show that you've all put together. It's been really something. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And the book that you put together, how timely. Uh, did you plan this? No. <laughs> It's it's wonderful. Um, there's been a lot of conver there's always the conversation for uh, Occupy Wall Street didn't do anything. Occupy Wall Street didn't achieve anything. But your book talks about how basically Occupy Wall Street reshaped American culture. Can you give us a little bit of a window into that premise? <clears throat> I think that, yeah, I mean, that's really it. I, I have been thinking about it, as I know you and many of your viewers have, you know, for the last 10 years. Um, and it really, um, I tried to write this story closer to the movement uh, after the movement sort of dissipated and sort of disappeared, but it was still too close and, and the impacts weren't clear enough. And I wasn't distant enough from it to sort of look at it more analytically and historically. I think what we've seen and what you're showing today with this 10 year sort of a um, revision, you know, a, 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 a retrospective, is just the vast distance. It's become clearer watching the trends, the activism, the movements that have sprung up that Occupy helped seed the ground for um, from the Bernie movement and AOC and the new progressives that are steering the new Democratic Party message, you know, uh, to the fight for 15, the labor movement, the Walmart strikes, and you name it. I'd love to talk in more detail. Um, and the climate movement, all of these urgent mo movements that have defined this past decade, really, the teens, um, are, were essential to sort of set the historical record straight. I think that many people, certainly in the Trump era, you know, were sort of um, kind of ready to write Occupy out of history in the sense that it really didn't, you know, it had its moment, it flared, it burst out, we moved on and it left us with the 99% and the 1%, a new vocabulary, um, a new rhetoric, but what did it really leave behind? That was always, um, that's how I start the book, what happened to Occupy? For most people, it sort of vanished. For those of us who've really been following the story, um, it did not vanish. It, on the contrary, was really the birthing ground of this new era of widespread protest and resistance um, and a new politics in America, a new labor movement re-energized, fighting for its own interests and rights. And I, I felt compelled to tell the story. And yes, the 10-year mark seemed appropriate time. Lucky to bring it out now. You're so right about how it's too close to do it at the time. I mean, we everything had to unfold from there in order to really be able to draw those lines. And I'm really glad you did. Let's talk specifically about the labor movement. Um, we just had a guest on, or we've been covering things from the Bessemer, um, from the, the the Amazon protesters who wanted to, to unionize in Bessemer to the other labor issues that are going on right now, the airline uh, people who are being abused by the, the, the industry there. Um, we cover that all the time. Talk about um, the through line from mm -hmm. Occupy uh, to today's labor movement. Yeah, it's been fascinating. Um, I think this is an under a completely underreported, under recognized story. Um, Occupy's profound impact. So we all reckon we all remember that Occupy, you know, it injected the conversation of inequality, right? It sort of mm -hmm put the crisis of inequality on the map. No one had talked about it. It was all austerity politics. Obama was all about austerity, belt tightening measures across the Atlantic in Brussels and Washington. 
Occupy hit, of course, following the European movements that sort of at which followed the Arab Spring. So it wasn't as though Occupy created it out of thin air, but it took these messages of discontent, democratic and economic discontent felt across the planet and crystallized it in that simple phrase, the 99% and the 1%. Um, but then, as I say, most people think that it stopped there. You know, one year exactly after Zuccotti Park was cleared in November of 2012, um, the Fight for 15 got launched. Uh, Occupy Wall Street veterans, activists had been instrumental and had been on the bottom, on the, on the, on the front lines, helping organize with clergy, with unions, with community organizing groups to get the first several hundred fast food workers mobilized, get their kind of new $15 wage, minimum, minimum wage, unthinkable at that point. Now it's now it practically passed in the coronavirus stimulus bill uh, that was passed yeah. in March by Biden and the Democratic Congress. It was almost slipped in there by Bernie and company, um, but it shows just the degree to which that $15 minimum wage, the low wage worker movement has changed the conversation. It created the fight for 15, which which led to, you know, nationwide global strikes and protests that have gone on. It also uh, really pushed, and that of course led to more than 30 states raising their minimum wage, not to $15, but across legislatures, voters, anywhere where a raised minimum wage went on the ballot in the years after Occupy, it passed. People yeah. were mobilized, and then it translated to other movements like the Walmart worker strikes. I just wanted to say which ignited at the same time as the fight for 15. People forget this, the Black Friday strikes, the fact mm -hmm. that workers weren't paid a living wage at Walmart and are living off of food stamps and on Medicare when they're working full time. The same moment, a year after Occupy, they used Occupy tactics, the, the people's mic. They um, organized, it was like Occupy had delegitimized the 1%. And here you have this new, new in the next chapter in the inequality debate was actually the organizing of the labor movement by unions that heard the call and, uh, and they got a raise. They raised wages for half a million uh, workers at the world's largest retailer. That's a concrete result. And then you see it all the way through with the domestic workers, as you said, the airport workers, the supermarket clerks, the adjunct professors, which I formerly was. Um, yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, and you too. And how many viewers here, right? I mean, it translated across society. It lit that fire and it's hard to quantify. I think people don't make the connection to Occupy because, you know, it's not Occupy directly responsible, but there wasn't, you know, Ronald Reagan crushed the air traffic controllers workers back in 1981, 10,000, he just fired overnight. It dealt a generational blow to the country's unions, which really never have never properly recovered. They haven't. Um, but now for the first time really in decades, workers are demanding. I think we saw in the teacher strikes of 2018, a culmination in red state America. This was West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, the Carolinas, Arizona. You saw teachers in mass walking out demanding raises, which they won uh, because they had this new courage and message and demand that would not go silent. We simply didn't have that sort of labor militancy um, and I think the Occupy just lit that fire. And we see it, as you say, in the coronavirus time, I think, as well. Look at the new labor economy. People aren't willing to risk their health and lives for a paltry wage and very little secure and safe mm. you know, working conditions uh, any longer. I think they see that they have power, that the scales are balancing. And Congress, if it can pass this pro-union, the, 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 the pro act, uh, the, pro act yeah. the strongest act for unions in a generation, that would really cement this movement. But I think we've already seen just a dramatic rebalancing of, of the power. You know what I think is interesting? I heard um, an, uh, an occupier who was in the outreach committee uh, speak earlier today, and she said that uh, one of her jobs was to, uh, she, what they decided to do was to go and look up all of what labor was doing in New York City and and show up. It's not like labor just said, oh, there's a movement. Let's go. We're in this together. They didn't, they weren't, it didn't coalesce quite that way. I, the original occupiers went out to labor movements with signs saying, you are the 99%. And then those labor movements kind of got on board and they became part of the Occupy Wall Street fabric. Um, they got on board quickly as they recognized that the message was 
um, uh, you know, in line with everything that they've been doing this whole time. But it was, it was, it wasn't, it, it wasn't just a, a nation marriage of, of, uh, oh, Occupy Wall Street and labor. Occupy Wall Street, the original folks went out and, and, and courted other people who were from the working class who were also being decimated by uh, the structure of our financial system at the time. At this, it's the same pretty much right now. But um, but what are your what are your thoughts about that? I, th- I think it, yeah, that's a great point. I think it took real courage for labor. I think labor did not intuitively see a bunch of anarchists and sort of college educated young twenty year old white kids, which was how it was framed in the media. And if you went down to Zuccotti Park, you'd see a lot of them there. I don't think that the working rank and file at the start heard the occupied message speaking right to them. Or if they heard it, yeah, it might make sense, but these guys don't look like us. They certainly don't come from our, you know, we're not cut from the same cloth and we're, we're not, we don't belong there. I think that what Occupy Wall Street, and we covered it at, at the Occupied Wall Street Journal, I think it was our third edition, uh, really in the heart of the movement as it was just taking off um, October 5th. I remember it. I have it in the book. That was this critical day at Foley Square, October 5th, 2011, two and a half weeks into the movement, when it was supposed to be a student-led kind of march demonstration, and labor decided to lean in. They came out, the unions, the transport workers, the communication workers, um, you know, healthcare, nurses, United, various lots of labor groups. And I remember important labor leaders in the city, Stuart Applebaum with the retail union, um, retail union and, um, and Gershom and various people who are really key leaders in the city decided at those meetings, as you say, occupiers went out and Nalini Stamp, real leaders at Occupy who had these connections and ways to, to meet face-to-face um, and bring labor in. But it also, I remember the articles in the New York Times, it was, uh, there were real heavy debates. Do we join from labor? Do we join this movement that is essentially calling for an end to capitalism or for, you know, doesn't want to support any party or, or admit that there are leaders in Washington that they need to speak with? They had to come around. I think though, when they did, it was this revelatory moment. And I profile in the book, the Verizon workers, um, and one in particular, who, you know, they're not activists. These aren't, these aren't rah, rah, these aren't folks who go out in the street, but they saw they had a dog in this fight. And if they're not looking out for themselves, no one will. And once that message sank in that the 99%, they are it, we are it. Um, I think it just, it, it initiated this process that we're still seeing play out where labor is not the same that labor was a decade ago. It's an entirely new footing that it's been, that it's put itself on. And I think that, that the world took more note uh, and, and it became, the movement became more of a threat, didn't it? At that point, after that October 5th point, when labor um, got involved, it became more of a threat. And then we would see a more state repression. Is that accurate? State repression of workers? Of, a of state labor? repression of the people in the park. Oh, um, well, I mean, we certainly, you know, the one th- moment when labor really was critical was the night of potentially greatest repression, which was the night that Bloomberg sent in his, you know, militarized police to try to, who surrounded the park, but it ended up being the night of greatest triumph of Occupy, probably the sweetest moment before the bitter fall was um, that mid-October night when they, def- when occupiers defended the park thanks in part to about a 4.30 a.m. or 5 a.m. arrival of the uh, of workers from the made from the AFL-CIO who had sanctioned um, awesome. this protest. And they marched down in the middle of the night with Zuccotti filled with a, all the activists. But here comes organized labor saying, uh-uh, Bloomberg, you're not going to clear this park. We're defending it with the kids. And uh, that was that was this moment of really pretty magical solidarity. You know, I talked to longshore workers out here in Oakland. I'm in California um, for this book and, and talked to them. There's a lot of mixed feelings. Obviously, the way Occupy Oakland went down, the way that Occupy really wasn't in the long run able to really communicate with labor very well. They didn't do a real let's sit down and talk about how we can work together, Occupy in its brashness and its immediacy and aggressive you know, militant tactics sort of just went ahead and did what it was going to do and hope that people like labor would follow, like in the port shutdown um, that happened across the Western ports. 
and the longshoremen and the unions really left with pretty mixed feelings about Occupy and decentralized horizontal organizing efforts and all of that. Um, there, there could have been really more room that Occupy had it had different forms of leadership and structure could have possibly really kind of recruited and brought labor and maybe created some kind of alliance that would have helped the movement last longer. It didn't, but um, you know. That's but we're still here today doing things. <laughs> the movementarians as we, as, as they're called. Um, Michael Levitin, can you talk about, I know we're, we're almost at the top of the show and I can see my producer. Um, I'm looking to see if he's giving me a, oh, he gave me the okay. If you don't mind, because one of, I you know, you. one of the most impressing parts, one of the most pressing parts of our, uh, what we're fighting against, what activists are fighting against is climate change. And uh, you talked about in the book, the roots of some of the climate activism we're seeing today being in Occupy. Can you, can you draw those lines for us, please? I, I really, this was the part that helped me sell this book to the publisher in the first place. It was my sample chapter. Um, I was riveted. I mean, I think that this trajectory of Occupy to the Green New Deal it's fascinating. It's beautiful. It's um, it shows not only the character who drives my narrative and the Occupy Climate chapter in the book, who is Evan Weber, a co-founder of the Sunrise Movement. Mm. I mean, he is literally kind of an embodiment of the way that Occupy evolved into our modern climate movement. He was 20 years old as a college student uh, at Wesleyan, I believe, who came to down to Zuccotti and marched on the first day of the march. Came with you know a busload of several dozen college students made it all the way to the Trump building on day one of Occupy. He was a kid. He was one of the millennial, you know, one of the young ones who was, and he was right out in front. But his trajectory, how it shows of him going deep into the climate movement and ultimately leading, helping co-found the Sunrise Movement, which today is the most vocal um, and, and really effective youth. It's the Gen Z. It, it is really the face of the new climate movement. They learn so much from Occupy. I think what I learned in reporting this book and the climate section, occupiers went straight into the climate message. After Occupy dissipated, it's like they redirected the fight against inequality into the fight to save our planet. They translated that message of a broad us, 99% versus a narrow them, the 1%. They made the narrow them, the fossil fuel executives of the 1%, the lobbyists, the, the CEOs and shareholders who are strangling our planet and obstructing clean energy and progress uh, for their short-term term shareholder gain. They, they use that language and rhetoric and you see it. And I show this trajectory of right after Occupy ended. I mean, you got the student divestment movement which started on college campuses. Students needed something to do when they were energized by Occupy in 2011 and 2012. They started this movement that blew up like wildfire. Look at how it's a $15 trillion movement globally today of fossil fuel divestments from huge portfolios, BlackRock and all the rest. That, that started out of Bill McKibben and a, and a handful of small you know, college campuses launching this movement, but it used this radical tactics and energy of Occupy in more organized ways. The fossil fuel resistance that shut down one project after the next in the Pacific Northwest, coal export terminals, gas export terminals, coal trains, um, oil trains, you name it, they just went down falling like dominoes, literally because activists got lit and they had legal arguments behind them. They translated that energy and like commitment um, to Occupy, they translated into the climate movement. They, they, in a sense, created the new climate movement, which really didn't exist until Occupy fused with what was at that point the Keystone XL fight. That was, that amounted to the climate movement and that Keystone fight evolved, that succeeded, they shut down the Keystone, but it evolved into Standing Rock, right? Into a 10 month occupation of people driving across the country AOC got her start at Standing Rock by going there and standing in solidarity with the with the Sioux reservation, the Sioux people um, on their on their on their land and wise water protectors. And then it translated into uh, my goodness, the global climate strikes and uh, <laughs> Greta Thunberg. Obviously, that's not Occupy per se. That's in Europe, but the energy here to mobilize young people, digital natives, Gen Z walking out by the millions because they heard their generational call of decentralized sort of organizing similar to Occupy, going out, 
extinction rebellion combining with all this i mean it's like we have seen you know these are dark times the climate we're imperiled the congress is not moving it's as bad it seems as it you know we're close to some major progress but we're not there and yet the mobilizing is radically different today i like to think because occupy helped light that fuse you've got a whole generation that isn't going to be silenced any longer and uh, look at extinction rebellion direct action taken really out of the Occupy playbook by a lot of the same people from Occupy who are helping lead that movement. I hope mm -hmm. it really uh, resurges and combines with the new, the new generation of activists to um, actually get it done. The final point being Sunrise, they learned from Occupy's mistakes because Occupy did not have structure or policy. It did not want to enter the political process. It was explicit about that. What Evan Weber and the Sunrise folks did is they studied what Occupy got wrong. They, they, they went and they actually learned with Occupy Wall Street organizers, some of the best ones who founded Momentum, an organization that went to train young groups of activists, the next generation of activists to kind of assimilate, to, to um, take what they have learned from past movements, from the civil rights era, from the Gandhi, from various civil disobedience movement, apartheid, um, the color revolutions of Eastern Europe, all Black Lives Matter, Occupy, see what worked, see what didn't. And they used a lot of tactics from Occupy, but then they used political pressure to get candidates elected to drive AOC to announce the Green New Deal. And here we have at the top of the Democratic Party platform in the 2020 election, and now in the congressional $3.5 trillion um, budget bill, a climate core and a billion, hundreds of billions of dollars to invest if it passes in climate solutions. So there's progress. Let's acknowledge it. Michael, you mentioned uh, Extinction and Rebellion as uh, one of our coworkers at Act TV was walking down to Zuccotti Park today. She passed, I believe it was the New York Public Library, where there's a huge Extinction Rebellion movement with banners and signs and people there trying to end fossil fuels um, out in the street as we speak. So um, it's it's happening. And I do really appreciate you coming on the program. Final, final topic and a brief, brief, uh, because we're the show is supposed to be over, but we're keeping going because that's the beauty of not being, you know, curtailed by by advertising and having to stop it when when we have to play, uh, you know, an ad for Zeltrex or whatever the next thing is. You were one of the co-founding editors of the Occupied Wall Street Journal, and now you are um, a journalist. You've appeared in the Atlantic, the Guardian, Newsweek, Time, the LA Times, and just can you talk a little bit? about the state of our media landscape and how that is tied to the Occupy Wall Street movement. Mm -hmm. I mean, it. Um, I think the media has probably really shifted also since uh, I didn't really address that in the book per se, but now that you ask it, I mean, the media- <laughs> Add a chapter. Can you put yeah, it in the follow-up? <laughs> I mean, I have a technology section and actually one of your colleagues there, Harry Weisbrin, was one of the central characters helping drive that narrative of how technology um, helped Occupy kind of overcome the media barrier. The fact that people at Occupy, and I think you already referred to it a while earlier on the show, um, figured out how to puncture and get through the media blockade. I think that um, when Occupy hit, 10 years ago today, amazing that we're on this day. Um, it really, uh, yeah, the media wasn't capable of hearing that message. It was too abstract. It was too um, overwhelming, too systemic of, a, of an announcement that Occupy was, you know, the verdict that our system was bankrupt in itself, that capitalism and the 1% and inequality, everything needed to be reined in, corporate control of politics. So the media did its best to ignore it. It stood around on the sidelines for one week trying to sort of say these are a motley crew of kids camping in a park and what do they really have to say and what are they about the media did what it typically does the mainstream media occupy and what we did at the occupied wall street journal and what everyone who was part of occupy who tweeted and facebook you remember social media was kind of newish at that point going online and instantly uploading a video from the streets of police brutality or simply a tweet or a blog it hadn't been used for activism in America yet. I think it had been used in the Green Revolution in Iran um, several years earlier. And then of course in the Arab Spring in the winter preceding Occupy. But we in America had never used these new tools, a phone in our pocket with a camera, upload a video, upload a tweet, upload a blog, Facebook, et cetera. 
make it viral, blow it up. And I think that the tech activists discovered that as much action as there was going on on the ground at Occupy, actually they were bringing in so much more online, creating this sort of virtuous cycle where it would action on the ground would stimulate real interest online among tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, which would bring more people into the streets, which would create more. It was like, it was, it was um, experimenting in real time with this new tech activism. And I think that, um, bless you. And I think that uh, the media in a sense really um, got the picture that, oh, they missed the ball. They immediately had to correct once the pepper spray cop incident, once Occupy blew up. I think that since Occupy, the mainstream media knows that this new generation isn't waiting for the media to cover the story. They're going to do it themselves anyway. Black Lives Matter. Here we are. Go. Here we are. <laughs> Black Lives Matter, Standing Rock, the climate strikes, March for Our Lives, a bunch of 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds walking out of high school in Parkland ignite a nationwide movement that helps dethrone the National Rifle Association finally. And it took a bunch of teenagers doing it on their own without, you know, maybe the media was covering, but it really didn't matter because they did their own media as the new generation has learned to do. So I think that really we have in our own way transformed media. Michael Levithan, thank you so much for joining me on the program. And it is nice to see you again. I don't think I've seen you since the lockdown and then years before that. Um, Generation Occupy is the new book. Congratulations on it. Generation Occupy, Reawakening American Democracy. I do suggest everyone go and get it. There were some really wonderful connections that you made there. And, and it is a, really a celebration of what's happened. And I found it very hopeful about uh, the fight that we're in on all fronts. So thank you so much for writing it. And thanks for being on our program. Thank you, Juliana. You guys are doing great work. Love that you're keeping it, keeping it going and building the next Let's bring on the 20s. Let's, do Let's bring on the 20s. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Appreciate it. Thank you. You are watching ACT TV. This is ACT Now, where we cover the progressive movement. We cover things that are happening on the ground. Most of the stuff that you're not going to see on mainstream media. I feel like everyone says, oh, you're not going to hear this on mainstream media. But this is stuff you're really not going to see on mainstream media because it doesn't even fit some weird, crazy narrative. It is... <laughs> it is... Um, it is the movement. So we thank you so much for watching. I thank everyone who was part of the Occupy movement and who takes any kind of action, whether it's sharing this with people who might want to learn about their history or um, being on the front lines of whatever movement they are in. Just thank you for all the work that you are doing. I'm Juliana Forlano. You can follow me on Twitter, follow ACT TV, please, across platforms. We are, we are growing and growing and growing, and it is all thanks to you. I will see you next week. Have a great weekend.